Hey, good afternoon. So for the last two lectures in this course, we're going to look at two virus stories that have had substantial impact in the past couple of years. They are scientifically important, but they have engaged a good uh, fraction of the public, patients included, patients with one of the diseases, as you will see, and the press has gotten involved in well. So there's been a lot of activity uh, with respect to these two stories that we're going to talk about. And I think it's important for you to see, now that you've had an entire course, you understand the science, now you can look at these two stories and see how they played out. One of them is complete, this first story that we'll talk about today. In fact, I, I gave this talk last year and it was not yet complete at the time, but now the story is finished and you can see how it all played out. And the next one that we'll talk about on Monday is not yet finished. So today we're going to talk about a virus called XMRV. And this begins with the disease prostate cancer, which is in today's New York Times, in fact. Uh, this comes in two forms. It comes in a sporadic form uh, where it just occurs and this increases as you get older. And there's also a familial form, which means there is a genetic component, you inherit it, and that may predispose you to it. And that onset is less than 55 years of age. There seems to be increased risk for contracting the disease if you have a mutation in the gene encoding RNA-L. You guys remember this gene? Ever hear of it? No. Yeah. That's the No, no, it's not going to be cumulative. But does anyone raise your hand if you know what RNA cell is? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even ask you to tell me what it is, just to, yeah, so no one knows what it is. Okay, so RNA cell is an interferon stimulated gene. So it is one of the over a thousand ISGs, and it has RNA activity, as the name says, and the idea is that this is induced. It's activated and then it degrades the viral genome. It actually is non-discriminatory, degrades everything in the cell. So there seems to be an increased risk of getting prostate cancer for having a mutation in RNA cell at position uh, amino acid 462 from an arginine to a glutamine. Okay, and um, so this is interesting because this, this gene, besides being involved in antiviral activity, so one idea is that this mutation predisposes you to an infection, and maybe that causes prostate cancer, or uh, this gene is also known to be, uh, ant be uh, anti-apoptotic or apoptotic, and the mutation would make it less so, and that would have a problem clearing a cancer cell. So this is the start of this story, and so uh, what some people did at UCSF was to say, is there, or to ask, is there a virus involved in prostate cancer? So they used uh, a DNA microarray where you take RNA from a specimen. Here it's showing the comparison of a virus infected versus an uninfected cell. You can make RNA from these two cells, reverse transcribe them, and make DNA in the presence of fluorescently labeled triphosphate precursors. So you get labeled DNA. And then you use that DNA to hybridize to a microscope slide on which you have many, many tiny dots, each of which contains a different sequence. Okay, and then you can read the hybridization in, in a fluorescent way. You can see if it's either uh, red or, or green or yellow, depending on the mixture of the RNAs in the two samples. So you can do this with, to look for viruses. You could take a, a prostate tumor, extract RNA, label it uh, with fluorescent dye, and hybridize it to a microarray like this on which you've put all the known DNA sequences, for example. So that's what was done in this case. They use what's called a viro chip, which has about 950 conserved sequences on it, different viruses. Of course, that's not all the known viruses, but you can hit uh, most of the major families this way. And what was done in this study was to take 19 prostate tumors from the Cleveland Clinic, and they extract RNA, they convert it to DNA, how would you do that? How would you convert RNA to DNA? Yeah. Okay, we got it. We, we learned everything we need to know in this course. Um, you would take reverse transcriptase, and this is just an example of great application of RT, 
uh, and you use these fluorescent dyes, you can make it fluorescently labeled, then you hybridize it to the virochip and you say, are there any viruses in this sample? Really powerful. Now, nowadays you could do this by just total deep sequencing of the sample. Um, it's, it's an argument which one would be cheaper. Dr. Silverstein, which would be cheaper? Microarray or sequencing? It would be still, but someday sequencing will be less, no? And then you can identify maybe viruses that you don't have on your chip as well. Anyway, so this was done, and here is the result. So you, you, this is a microscope slide here, part of it anyway. Let's turn the light off for a moment. Um, and each band, so these are, these are bars, not dots of DNA. So each hybridization appears as a band. And in this, these are uh, different samples here with the different numbers, VP, 7986, et cetera. There's a HeLa cell control. And you can see on, on this particular part of the microarray, there are 502 retroviral oligonucleotides. So the, uh, a good part of this microarray is represented by retroviruses. And you, excuse me, you can see that uh, some of the samples light up a variety of different retroviral samples. So you, you blow up this top part here, you can see uh, some of the patient samples were positive. And uh, then they took those samples and reconfirmed them with polymerase chain reaction against the gag of these retroviruses. And you can see there's a positive reaction in them. Okay, so that first said there's some kind of virus uh, in these samples. <clears throat> and it's a retrovirus. So the positive signal was from what we call gamma retroviruses. You'll see what that means in a moment. Seven of 11 tumors that were homozygous for this uh, RQ mutation in RNA cell. No positive signal in three tumors from the heterozygotes and one positive in five wild type RNA cell tumors. Okay, So in all um, 11 positives. And this was the genome that was present. So they eventually cloned the entire viral genome out of these samples starting from the little pieces that were in there. And it's all put together here at the top. You can see it's a typical retroviral genome. Two LTRs, it encodes GAG, PAL, and envelope. Uh, and all the expected proteins. And here is an alignment of the sequence. It's called XMRV uh, from two different patients. It's the patient number again, VP42 and VP62 with high homology to a variety of other retroviruses, particularly murine endogenous retroviruses, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So here is a phylogenetic tree of the sequences. Here in red are, the, are three of the patient sequences, three different patients. Uh, you can see these are all identical and highly related to a variety of other endogenous retroviruses of mice, this M. murine endogenous retrovirus, that's the Proviruses that are integrated in the mouse genome, um, urine leukemia viruses, uh, and a variety of others. Here's some feline leukemia virus, gibbon ape, and koala retrovirus more distant. So these are highly related to murine retroviruses, and they're all very similar to each other. This is just a tracking of the RNA L phenotype or genotype. Uh, these are PCR positive results, eight in the QQ, the mutant homozygous, none in the heterozygous. Uh, one in the wild type, uh, and then um, the negative ones are shown here. Okay, so not every tumor type is, is positive for this virus, but many of them are. This is a section of some of these prostate tumor tissues uh, to show you where there is some viral sequence. These are sections that are hybridized with a DNA uh, um, probe, so we're looking at nucleic acid here. And this green, these green dots are fluorescently labeled nucleic acids that are hybridizing to cells. So here is one section, for example, and this positive cell is this one right here. So in each of these sections, there's a single positive cell, which you can see. So these are, again, parts of the tumor specimens that were originally used to make RNA. They hybridized it to a nucleic acid probe. This is another example where we're using antibodies to probe these sections. So now we're looking for viral proteins. At this point, they didn't have an antibody to this particular virus, uh, so they use antibodies of spleen focus forming virus, which reacts with many different retroviral proteins. This is the GAG protein, which you know is a structural protein. So this reacts with a lot of different viral strains, and you can see it lights up cells uh, in these sections again from the prostate tumors. So what we learned from this is that we have a new uh, virus called XMRV. We'll explain in a moment why it's called that. 
Um, there's no murine sequences detected in any of these samples, so it's not um, uh, contaminated with mouse DNA. It seems to be mainly found in patient samples with the homozygous RNA cell mutation. There are polymorphisms, but just a few. In patient to patient, the samples are almost identical, these viral samples, but there are some differences, so we call those polymorphisms. Um, you get antigens and protein in uh, prostate tissue, but in interestingly, the positive signal, the DNA and the protein signal, is not in the tumor, DNA, uh, not in the tumor cells themselves, but rather in uh, stromal fibroblasts, which are normal, which surround the tumor. So that's, if the virus is causing the tumor, it's weird that the nucleic acid and protein is not in the tumor itself. So this would be the first example of human infection with a, um, a murine leukemia-like vi virus, let's say. So this was the paper that arose from this. It was published in PLOS Pathogens in March 2006 uh, from the Derisi group at UCSF, which uh, is a big virus discovery group, and also collaborator uh, Bob Silverman, who is a big innate immune person. He works on RNA cell, among other things. Okay, so the questions that arose from this, first of all, XMRV, when they sequenced it, they didn't find an oncogene in it. Remember, some retroviruses transform cells by they picking up an oncogene from the cell, and you can easily see that when you sequence the viral genome, so they didn't see it here. Secondly, the genome in the protein was in stromo cells, not the actual cancer cells, so as I said, that's odd. So they don't prove that this virus causes cancer. By far, they do not prove it. You have to do a lot more work uh, to prove that itself. And of course, what you'd like to know while you're doing that is what's the source of this virus? How did these people get this virus if in fact it's causing uh, prostate cancer in them? So uh, th this virus is a retrovirus, and this is to remind you the retroviridae family is composed of many genera of retroviruses. We've talked about lentiviruses here in this course, HIV 1 and 2. We've talked a little bit about delta retroviruses, the HTLVs, uh, human T-cell lymphotropic viruses. Uh, the virus today we're talking about is a gamma retrovirus, just a different genus, structurally and genetically different from uh, the ones we've talked about so far. One of the first things that was done was to take this sequence from the tumor tissue, so they sequence the whole genome. And I should point out, by the way, that, and I forgot to tell you this, first example of human infection with XMRV virus. In no experiment in that paper did they actually show that infectious virus was present. Now you, would, you should do that. You should take some of the sample and put it in cell culture and try and grow a virus out. But all they have here is nucleic acid. So to say that it's an infection is not quite right. You have nucleic acids to show there's virus, you have to do something else. And I'm very picky about that, but often people confuse the two. Nucleic acid is not virus, unless you show it's infectious. All right, so what was done was to take the DNA sequence that had been assembled from these tumor tissues, they made a DNA copy, put it in a plasmid, put that into cells, and then they got virus out of that because the DNA is infectious. It can initiate an infectious cycle. And this is the virus that they got out. It's a typical uh, gamma retrovirus. So that DNA sequence can encode an infectious virus, but again, the virus was not form found in the tumor tissue, only sequences and antigens. Gamma retroviruses are simple retroviruses. They're not like HIV with all the extra proteins. They have gag, pollen, and envelope genes. They are quite widespread in nature. They infect a lot of different animals. They can infect as virions or infectious vi or exogenous viruses. They can enter the germline and be passed from animal to animal in the germline. And those germline copies can make viruses. They can be transmitted from mother to offspring uh, and initiate viremia in the offspring. In the various animals that they infect, they cause a lot of different diseases, including cancers of different sorts, so they could be associated with prostate cancer. But typically, when they cause cancer, they do so by uh, insertional uh, activation of an oncogene. Remember, that's another way RNA tumor viruses cause cancer. They insert in the genome next to an oncogene, turn it on, and the cell tar starts dividing uncontrollably. And in these animals that get infected, uh, infection is lifelong. Now, why xenotropic? There are four kinds of endogenous 
murine leukemia viruses. Endogenous means the DNA is in the germline, the proviral DNA is there, of course, and it's passed from animal to animal that way. Four kinds ecotropic, these viruses only infect mice, no other species. So the mouse produces them, it infects the mouse, and it doesn't infect anyone else. These are just maps of the uh, proviral DNA is just to show some of the differences. What's really important are the names here. The xenotropic viruses are produced in mice, but they can't infect the mice. They can only infect other species. We'll, we'll see why in a moment. Uh, and that's what this virus was. You could tell that this was a xenotropic virus by the sequence. So that's how you can classify all these. Polytropic can infect many species, and modified is just a, a subset of that. Yes? The question is, if this retrovirus can't infect mice, how are they making it? Yeah. Anyone have a clue? That's a good exam question, but we can answer it here. Anyone have a clue? How would a mouse make this virus if it can't be infected? Okay. Remember, how is, the, um, how is it passed from mouse to mouse? What? Not by virions, but by... Yeah, it's in the genome. So it's passed in the genome of the mouse. It's always there. It's been there since the days when it first got in. Well, wouldn't that be considered infection? The infection happened millions of years ago. But now today, it's today it's not able to infect the mouse because in those millions of years, the mouse receptor has mutated and now the mouse is resistant. Probably to resist, you know, there were a few mice initially that didn't uh, get infected, didn't get sick, and those perpetuated. But yeah, so at some point, millions of years ago, the, mi the virus infected the mouse, but now it's just in the germline. It's passed. They make particles, but they can't infect the mouse because the receptor is mutated. Okay? All right. So that's why it's xenotropic. It's made in mice, but it can't infect mouse cells. Uh, in, in mice, just a little bit about the pathogenesis of these retroviruses, the ecotropics, that is the viruses that can infect mice, um, many strains of mice. Uh, make these, they die within a year of a, of a thymic lymphoma. It's typical strains of mice do this. Uh, and this is caused by integration adjacent to one or more oncogenes, as we've talked about before. Uh, and uh, most mice um, express a virus at the time of birth of some sort or another, and many of them will die of leukemia. The xenotropics are slightly different. Uh, these are pretty recent discoveries. Uh, again, they replicate in uh, other cells other than the mouse that makes them. They're inherited as endogenous proviruses, of course. That's how it's still in the mouse population. The receptor is XPR1, and this mouse, the mouse gene encoding it is mutated, so the virus cannot infect it any longer. Uh, so presumably at some point in history, it mutated to make the mice resistant, but the DNA was in the, in the germline. Couldn't get rid of the DNA. It was passed on. Most mammals, XPR1, can be used by this virus. So the XPR1 of humans could serve as a receptor for XMRV. Uh, very low levels of, of XMRV in mice because it can't spread. So any virus that's present in the mouse is produced by the proviral DNA. But there's one thing that you have to uh, understand at this point is that uh, if you take human cells and put them in mice, those cells can be infected by these xenotropic viruses. So often people uh, try and grow tumors in mice, human tumors in mice, to propagate them. And it's been shown a long time ago that you can, you can rescue these ex, uh, xenotropic viruses out of mice by doing that. You're putting human tissue in the mouse, which is susceptible to the virus, so then that gets infected. And then when you pull the tissue out and you put it in culture, it's infected with the virus. And many years ago, uh, when people did this, they thought they were finding new human uh, retroviruses, but they turned out to be just rescuing uh, mouse viruses out. So these were called rumor viruses. Okay, they're not real human viruses, tumor viruses, rumor viruses. Scientists have a dry sense of humor. So where did it come from? Uh, so different parts of the U.S. these samples came from. Uh, and as you'll see, different diseases associated with it. So there could be a recent uh, introduction into people and, and limited cycles because the, the sequences were so similar. Uh, probably re fairly recent transfer from mice because they had, the sequences are quite close to the murine viruses. So the next question is, do you find this particular virus in any kind of mouse? 
uh, a lab mouse or a wild mouse. So here's the idea. You have viruses infecting mice. Many years ago, uh, the virus particles are made in this mouse. It infects another one. It endogenizes the mouse, which means that it goes in the genome. And then at some point, the mice are selected with a receptor mutation, so they don't die of the infection, but they still have the proviral DNA. and now becomes a xenotropic virus. It's not spread to other mice, just passed along in the germline. At some point, the idea is this got into people. And maybe it spreads from person to person, and maybe that's what XMRV is. So let's ask the question, is there any DNA related to this in mouse DNA? So you design a PCR assay. Here's the XMRV genome. You design PCR primers shown in red and green that will specifically amplify XMRV and not other endogenous retroviruses. You have to remember that there are many, many endogenous retroviruses in mice. So you have to design a specific PCR assay. So this is a, an example of all the mouse strains that were looked at. So you, you get all these mice. There are lab mice here and a variety of outbred and, and wild mice, other species as well. You take a little tail, you make DNA, and you do a PCR assay looking for XMRV. All these, uh, most of these were, were negative for XMRV. They do have proviruses related to XMRV, but none of these mouse strains have a single provirus with the exact sequence of XMRV. So it doesn't look like those were the immediate source. So again, it's consistent with a transmission event from mouse to humans and then adaptation uh, in human to humans as well. So remember now the retroviruses, when they infect cells, they make a DNA copy of their genome, which then integrates into the genome. And so this is a good signature for an infected cell, the integration site. And remember, when we get integration of proviral DNA, you have a deletion uh, of the ends of the provirus and a duplication of the host DNA. So if you sequence the integration site, you can get evidence that this is a retrovirus by these signature uh, sequence markings, the deletion of the retroviral ends and the duplication of the host DNA. So here's a study from published in October 2008 Integration site preference of XMRV, uh, a new retrovirus associated with prostate cancer. Now we're using this term associated because we only find it in, in cancer cells and, or, or prostate tumors, but we can't prove yet that it's causing the disease. So what they did is they cloned out 14 integration sites from uh, nine different patient tumors uh, and they sequenced them and they could see that these are in fact XMRV integrating into the host DNA. But interestingly, there's no integration near an oncogene. So remember, these viruses don't carry an oncogene, and now we know there's no integration next to an oncogene. So that's, that's kind of problematic. Here's just an example of the kind of data you get. You clone out an integration site, and you can clone them out of different chromosomes, as shown here. Uh, here is the XMR sequence on the left in small letters, and you can easily find that and then you see genomic sequence, and then you have enough genomic sequence, so then you can say, what gene are we at? And you can see exactly that here, you're next to a gene uh, encoding CREB5, and you can see that the UTR is right here. And the same for all these others. You can see the junctions of XMRV with human uh, DNA. So this was from uh, prostate tumors, again. So suggesting that, in fact, there's a provirus, there's an XMRV provirus, in this tumor DNA. So that's pretty good evidence that uh, the virus has infected this. Now, a lot of people got excited by this, these data, of course, and they started doing experiments in many different places all over the world. Here's a study out of Germany looking in people with sporadic prostate cancer. Uh, it was detected in one, by XMRV was detected by PCR in one out of 105 tissue samples. Uh, from non-familial, sporadic, and in one of 70 from normal controls. So this is a very low rate, and it's in both um, people with, with and without prostate cancer. So this is not a good result if you think that the virus is, is causing prostate cancer. Here's another study, which was out of the lab of Ela Singh, who used to be up at uh, Columbia. Uh, and subsequently moved to uh, Utah and now is back in New York at Mount Sinai. She looked at 100, 233 
uh, sections and 100 controls. She's a pathologist, so she got these tumor samples, sliced them up, and looked for DNA and protein. DNA by hybridization, and then she had an antibody that she had made against the virus. She grew the virus up, injected it into rabbits, and made antibodies against it. She found DNA in 6% of tumors and 2% of controls and protein in 23% of tumors, 4% in trolls. And what she found, interestingly, different from the original study, she found staining predominantly in the malignant cells themselves, not just the stromal fibroblasts. Yes? Uh, maybe you've covered this, but is there any reason why when we want to make a tumor, we do it in a mouse, but when we want to make antibodies, we just do it in rabbits or goats? So m mice are uh, inbred, so if you want to do some genetics, that, that's useful in rabbits or not. Uh, you can make antibodies in mice as well. So uh, it's, if you want to make a monoclonal, uh, you make it in mice. You can't make it in rabbits. But uh, if you want to make a lot of antibodies, rabbits is good because they're a larger animal. Yes, Dr. Silvers. It's just a cost factor. Yeah. And you can make a monoclonal in rabbits. And if you want to make tumors, you use mice because you use nude mice without immune systems. Yeah. Otherwise, the tumor is rejected. Right. But you put it in a rabbit, it would probably be rejected. And we didn't cover it, so. There you go. All right, so this was the positive study. And here's an example of this. This is um, some of the sections. And the brown is the staining with an antibody against XMRV. And this is tumor tissue. So stroma is around it, you can see. And this is all tumor tissue, malignant glandular epithelium staining for uh, XMRV. Another study, uh, also in Europe, uh, 589 prostate tumors, and, and also some serum samples, no nucleic acid or antibodies in this study as well. So this is another negative study. So many, many studies have been done. Uh, up in, this is a summary until the end of 2011, Ex looking for XMRV in prostate cancer. Uh, you can see the number of cases, the number of controls that were looked at, and the percent positive in the ca prostate cancer cases. You can see there's some low positivity and a lot of zeros. So a mixed uh, signal. Uh, these are s scattered throughout the world, different studies in different countries, but no common uh, detection in all of these studies. All right, so at this point, uh, people were also studying uh, this virus, and they found, this lab uh, out of uh, Washington found that uh, a cell line, a prostate cancer cell line, which had been made many years ago, called 22RV1, actually makes this virus. This was a not known at all that this cell line made this, but they happened to be looking at EMs of them and they saw viral particles in them and it turned out to be XMRV1. This cell line was made by taking a human prostate tumor and putting it in nude mice. So as I said, you want to grow a human tumor, make a cell line out of it so you can study it, you put it in nude mice that don't have immune systems and it will grow, uh, and that's what they did with this cell line. Uh, the sequence is nearly identical to the XMRV that was cloned out of the tumors. And the authors write here, we conclude that 22RV1 RV1 virus is XMRV and is not a mouse virus uh, acquired during the cell passage of the cells in culture or in mice. Okay? So this was quite a surprising finding. All right, so now we turn to the second disease associated uh, with this virus, and that is chronic fatigue syndrome. So this was a very high profile paper published in Science in October 29. Detection of an infectious retrovirus XMRV in blood cells of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So let's look at some of this. First, chronic fatigue syndrome, if you don't know about the disease, it's also called CFIDS, chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, ME, myalgic encephalitis, many other names. The CDC has given it the name CFS, and there are, this is probably not a good name because it gives it a bad connotation, but it has stuck. There are about 17 million people estimated to have this uh, disease. Unknown etiology started picking it up before the 1900s uh, in different parts of the world. There's no diagnosis for, there's no lab test for CFS except to apply certain criteria, to eliminate most other causes and then uh, apply other criteria. Uh, it consists of severe incapacitating fatigue that is not improved by bed rest, uh, with symptoms lasting at least six months, 
heart problem sleeping, concentration, short-term memory, various pain, post-exertional malaise, um, and these are some of the ways that you diagnose the disease. About a quarter of the patients are, are fully disabled, and there's a pattern of relapse and uh, remission in this disease. Some people get better, some people never do. So um, they're in these patients who have been studied extensively, there is a very chronic low-grade inflammation always present. They have poorly functioning NK cells. They have various neurological and metabolic abnormalities, and they tend to be infected more frequently than controls with a variety of viruses. So over the years, people have felt that uh, various herpes viruses, enteroviruses cause chronic fatigue until it's been disproven. So here's one of the experiments in this paper uh, suggesting that XMRV is involved in CFS. These are PCRs, polymerase chain reactions, using nucleic acids from peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And these are, these are PCRs using XMRV primers. And these are CFS patients in normal control. So you can see this is a positive uh, DNA here for the GAG gene and the envelope gene. Uh, 68 out of 101 patients, normal controls 3.7%. So you can see there is um, nucleic acid in the blood cells of these patients. Uh, that, that was sequenced, of course, and those sequences are up here in red, XMRV. They're very similar to the prostate XMRV sequences, perhaps just a few nucleotide differences. And again, they're very similar to many other uh, XMRs, uh, xenotropic leukemia viruses from mice as well. Uh, these are experiments to look for viral proteins or antibodies in these patients. So on the upper left is a flow cytometry where you take cells and pass them through a detector and ask if they are binding antibodies that you're using in the assay. So here we're using antibodies to a murine leukemia virus that cross-react with XMRV. And here we have uh, PBMCs from a normal patient. So you can see without and with antibody, without is, is the white and with antibody is black. So normal PBMCs don't react with antibodies against MLV. But you can see these patient samples, these are from the institute uh, and the patient number is shown here. They shift the histogram to the right, meaning these cells are reacting uh, with the antibody. So apparently there are uh, XMRV related antigens in these patients. Uh, also our western blots shown here and here. These are again western blots of proteins from peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cells probed with various antibodies to different retroviruses, to envelope glycoproteins, uh, GAG proteins, and you can see that these patients uh, have reactive proteins in their blood. On the right, uh, lower right shows you that uh, ant antibodies detect viral proteins uh, in both T cells and B cells of these patients. So here's a normal B cell, normal T cell patient. T cell and B cell, again, you shift to the right. That means the cells are producing uh, antigen. This is a surface labeling assay. And here's another Western blot, similar results. And on the right, you can see that you can rescue uh, from lymphocytes put in culture, uh, you can rescue some viruses out. So some of these patients, in fact, seem to have some infectious virus. So you take peripheral blood cells, you mix it with uh, some kind of cell line that's susceptible to the virus, and that this will grow out virus particles. And this finally is uh, taking sera from the patients. You take a little serum, cell-free serum, you ask are there antibodies to the virus? So you do flow cytometry with a cell line that either does, uh, does not express or expresses a viral uh, glycoprotein that would cross-react with XMRV. So here's your control cells no reactivity with the patient sera, normal and control. And here you have um, normal plasma and control, and, and patient plasma showing reactivity with these cell lines. So again, you have a cell line that expresses a viral glycoprotein on the surface. You mix it with serum from a patient and ask the, the antibo other antibodies that are binding. And the, and the answer is yes here. However, remember, none of these are antibodies or reagents that are specific for XMRV. These are other retroviruses, so all you can say is that there's some retroviral reactivity here. Not, you can't say that it's XMRV from these uh, kinds of experiments. So the summary, uh, they show an association between XMRV and chronic fatigue syndrome. 
Is, is the virus causing it or is it a passenger? Are these people just very susceptible to infections because they have uh, poor immune systems? Uh, there, in these patients, there was no correlation with an RNA cell genotype as with the prostate tumors. And the interesting thing here was that they found uh, XMRV in 3.7% of healthy blood donors. So that's a lot of people um, because um, several million people in the U.S. and if this is really a, a pathogenic virus, that means the blood supply could be contaminated. So that raised a lot of eyebrows early on. This was picked up by the press because the CFS community is big and very vocal. They have been trying for decades to get a cure or f further, further disease and many people have not even believed that they have had a disease for many years. So they're very vocal and this, this was picked up by the press. Here's an article from the New York Times. Uh, virus found in many with chronic fatigue syndrome. Your buddy here, Denise Grady, right? And uh, also one down here by Dave Tuller, who is a professor of journalism at, at uh, Berkeley, uh, who also wrote many articles on this. So I got to know Dave very well because he would call me frequently and ask me uh, all about this. Okay, so here, uh, shortly afterwards, about a year later, so we're waiting for confirmation. About a year later, something came out of the FDA and NIH, detection of MLV-related virus in blood of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. <laughs> so these are a different cohort of patients. And um, here they found sequences in 32 of 37 CFS patients to three of 44 healthy controls. Um, these sequences are, and they had actually multiple sequences from some of these individuals, one taken at one point and another 15 years later, and they were both positive. These sequences were more distant from XMRV, more like the uh, polytropic MLVs that can infect uh, mice and as well as other different animals. More sequence diversity than uh, XMRV. So that um, was a bit different, but it was felt to confirm uh, the original finding. So now, as you might guess, many, many individuals went on to look at the, for the presence of this virus uh, in CFS patients. So here are some of the studies that have been done. Studies finding the virus or sequences, I should say. The last paper we just talked about, the Low et al. paper, they did not find virus. They just reported PCR fragments in these patients. Okay, So uh, I, this should be XMRV sequences. So the original Lombardi and Low et al. papers. And then there are a slew of papers with no detection of XMRV either by PCR or serology in the UK, in Europe, Asia, uh, Japan, nothing. Okay. At the same time, uh, many people were excited that XMRV could be a cause of CFS. And this paper came out of uh, Ela Singh's lab showing that the virus is inhibited by raltegravir, which is a FDA licensed antiviral used to treat AIDS. So this suggested that if, in fact, it turned out that XMRV were the agent of CFS, you could use this to treat it. Now what it meant is that many people suddenly went to their doctors and said, could I have raltegravir because I have chronic fatigue and I really want to get out of this, this state, so please help me. And this was a big issue because these drugs are not without side effects. And of course, uh, physicians can prescribe drugs off-label for this kind of application, but it's very risky because if you don't, if it turned out that the virus was not the agent, you're taking a drug for, for no reason. Uh, in uh, the beginning of 2011, this story began to fall apart. Uh, a number of papers were published at the same time showing that if you're not really careful, you can contaminate your PCR reactions with murine DNA. So this was one from Myra McClure's lab, mouse DNA contamination in human tissue tested for XMRV. So they got some CFS samples uh, and um, they, they, sorry, this one was, this is prostate cancers. They subsequently did a uh, CFS. So this is a prostate cancer. They had obtained some samples. They looked for XMRV. They found it in 4.8%, but all these positive samples also were contaminated with mouse DNA. And 20% of the XMRV negatives were also positive for mouse DNA. So there's widespread contamination with mouse DNA. Um, 
another paper at the same time published an endogenous murine leukemia viral genome contaminant in a commercial RT-PCR kit. So when you do PCR you buy a kit with all the reagents in it and so this study showed that those kits, some of those kits are contaminated with mouse DNA and in fact it will pick up you can amplify XMRV sequences from these PCR kit reagents alone. Another study from Brigitte Huber and John Coffin, contamination of human DNA samples with mouse DNA. Again, they looked at CFS patients. Uh, there were a few positives, XMRV positives. These all had uh, mouse DNA contamination. And I put up a movie uh, of John Coffin talking about this. John Coffin has worked on endogenous retroviruses his whole career. And in this movie, he tells you that if you take a drop of mouse DNA and put it in a swimming pool and mix it up and take out uh, a mill and do a PCR, you will detect murine leukemia virus DNA because PCR is that sensitive. And he says mice are everywhere. And when you buy a reagent from a company, you don't know if the mouse has been in the warehouse where they make sodium chloride and the mouse is urinating on it at night when no one's around. And he says, in your lab, who knows what's walking all over your scales and pipettes at night? So mouse DNA turns out to be everywhere, and it can contaminate many samples. Another paper out of uh, the UK, disease-associated XMRV are consistent with lab contamination. He also found that mouse DNA can contaminate patient samples. And he found that the genetic variation in XMRV recovered from that cell line. Remember, 22RV1 makes... XMRV. He just isolated uh, many different viruses and sequenced them and he found that the genetic variation among those was bigger than all the XMRV uh, variation seen in patients so far, which is not consistent with transmission because as you know, viruses vary greatly when they transmit uh, from person to person. At the same time, in the same month, Greg Towers found he went back to those cell lines that had been used to study the integration sites um, of XMRV. Remember we talked about a study earlier where integration sites were looked at in both tumor tissue and the cell line and he found that um, two of 14 patient derived integration sites were identical to sites cloned in the same lab from virus infected cells. So in other words in the paper I showed you earlier they reported in prostate tumor the integration of XMRV into the genome. He says that this is a contaminant because it's the exact same sequence uh, from a cell line that the authors had published years earlier. Okay. And that you never get the same identical integration site in two different cells that you infect with a retrovirus. So he thinks that all the integration studies were all the result of contamination of uh, an infected cell line. So I thought that the, the integration was one of the stronger evidences in favor of an etiology, but now this is pretty much shown to be contamination. Ela Singh also weighed in. She did a very big study uh, of CFS patients. There's a big cohort at the University of Utah where she had moved to. She did very careful studies and she showed no XMRV in patients uh, with chronic fatigue syndrome. Now this, I'm showing you, this is a blog post I wrote about this. And I want you to note that here there are 532 comments. And if you go look at these, you will see a patient population that is absolutely fed up with science, that doesn't trust anyone anymore, doesn't even believe this result because their hopes were raised that this could be uh, the agent of their disease and now all this contamination is, is turning out and, and they really don't like it. So uh, if you have a thick skin, go read some of these because some of them are pretty nasty. But this is just to show you how this viral story engaged the public as well, the patients who want a cure for their disease. So let's continue with this. People wanted to know where this virus came from. So if, if it is a contaminant, where did it come from? How do we explain these findings? So John Coffin and Vinay Patak decided to look at this 22RV1 cell line. Remember, this is this prostate tumor-derived cell line, which was found uh, just a few years ago to produce XMRV. So they said, where did this come from? They were able to get some old samples of this cell line and all of the precursors of it. So remember, these cell lines start with a patient tumor. 
So they didn't get anything available, but there were records of a patient, CWR22, Case Western Reserve. This was a tumor, prostate tumor specimen. This was implanted in 1992 into a nude mouse in order to propagate the tumor. And eventually that tumor became cell line 22RV1. You can see that's called a xenograft when you put a tumor of one species into another. And then it goes from mouse to mouse. You let the tumor grow, you take it out, you put it into a nude mouse. And eventually you try putting it in culture and growing it and you will get something that grows. So you can see all the passages here. And they were able to get some genomic DNA from various passages you can see, as well as the later passages. Uh, and as well, they got the cell line, of course, which everyone still has, and then also an alternative cell line that was found. So they found a remarkable thing, and that's illustrated in this uh, image here. So here is the first nude mouse. So again, these mice don't have immune systems, so you, tumors will propagate in them very readily. You took that human prostate cancer sample, CWR22, we injected it into nude mice and it grows and eventually it's passaged in serially in nude mice, eventually becomes a cell line that produces XMRV. What they found is that in the original nude mice used to make this first implant and many of the early passages and, and the late passages in the cell line, uh, they contain XMRV sequences. So the late passages have virus in them, that's red. The early passages have two different retroviruses which they call pre-XMRV1 and pre-XMRV2. Neither of these produces infectious virus in the mice. They have mutations in them. All right, but if you uh, recombine them, you can get out XMRV. All right, so these are two precursors, non-infectious precursors to XMRV, and at some point here in the passage, uh, these recombined to form an infectious virus known as XMRV. So how do we know that? Well, they sequenced both of these. These are proviral DNAs in the mouse genome, and they compared the sequence of those to XMRV, which had been isolated from patients. And here's what they found. Here's pre-XMRV1 and 2. The green sequences are what match almost identically XMRV, which came out of patients. So you can see if you start at the left end of this genome here, you have what we'll call it XMRV, but then you diverge, and that's the other pre-XMRV. So here's one recombination event, and then you pick up some more green sequence, which is identical to XMRV, and you go back to the other and back again and back. So you have uh, seven recombination events, I think is the number, that can give rise to what is virtually the same virus present in people and which is produced by that cell line 22RV1. So the implication is, again, you put human tumors into mice, they will rescue out infectious virus. The mouse cells did not have <coughs> infectious XMRV, but, but having the human cells selected for a recombinant that was infectious. So did they ever show that these were totally human cells? Yes, they did. They, that's, they did extensive genotyping to prove that uh, these were human cells put in there. Yeah. Okay, does everyone see this? This is the genesis of XMRV. Uh, the passage of a human prostate tumor in um, nude mice. And remember, this 22C, what is it called? 22, <laughs> CWR22 cell line was not known for years to have, to be producing virus. So you can imagine it's used in all kinds of labs and you don't treat it as virus infected. So these cells make a lot of virus. So it's easy to see how that virus contaminated many, many different specimens and maybe I'm speculating, maybe the, some of the tumor samples that were sent initially to UCSF uh, to do that first study. So in my view, this was really the end because this is a completely lab-generated virus. There's no way this can cause a disease in people because it was made in a lab. And the only way that it would cause a disease is if whatever lab it was made in somehow infected someone, but the epidemiology of the disease is not consistent with that. So now a number of studies were done to see if the original um, detection of virus in the CFS patients could be reproduced. And here is a big study published in 
science not too long ago. Uh, this was called the Blood XMRV Scientist Scientific Research Working Group. The purpose of this was to see if XMRV constituted a threat to the blood supply. Because if it's really 3% of healthy people, that would be an issue. And a lot of the authors were from uh, the original labs that published this study. Uh, the Lombardi et al, Mikovits, Harvey Alter, Lowe, Ruschetti, and also people from uh, uh, other labs as well. So they got a number of the original patient samples, they blinded them and distributed them to a number of different labs and had people do their assay of choice, antibody detection, PCR, virus culture. And basically no one was able to pick up anything uh, convincing. So here um, only two labs reported evidence of the viruses. However, replicate sample results showed disagreement and reactivity was similar among CFS subjects and negative controls. So they conclude current assays don't detect the virus and the blood screening is not warranted because to screen for another virus in blood would be uh, quite an undertaking. Uh, in the same issue of science, a study from Jay Levy's group at UCSF, he got some of the same samples that were used in the first science study and he tested them again. We found no evidence of XMRV or other MLVs uh, in these blood samples. So they couldn't, consistent with previous reports, we detected sequences in commercial lab reagents. Our results indicate that previous evidence linking XMRV to CFS is likely attributable to lab contamination. Uh, and then uh, subsequently in science as well, a partial retraction of the original report. Uh, this is authored by the original uh, individuals who are on that first science paper. And so what it says here, a re-examination by Silverman and Dasgupta. So Silverman was the collaborator from Cleveland Clinic. Um, a re-examination shows that some of the blood cells are contaminated with XMRV plasmid DNA. The following figures and table were based on the DNA and so they're retracting figure one, which is the PCR, and then uh, sequences. All the nucleic acid based figures in that paper basically were retracted. But notice they didn't retract the whole paper, they just partially retracted it because many of the authors felt there was still good evidence for uh, retroviral infection based on the antibody data. I want to remind you again that antibodies are very difficult to use to specifically detect a pathogen uh, because they, they are typically broader reactivity than, um, than would be could be used to identify one virus. And if it's a monoclonal, then it's usually a broadly reacting uh, monoclonal. Bruce Alberts, who is the editor in chief of science, tried to convince all the authors to retract the entire paper, but apparently he could not. So he retracted it himself. So he says science is fully retracting the report detection of an infectious retrovirus XMRV in blood cells of patients because multiple labs couldn't detect it. And then in addition, there is evidence of poor quality control in a number of specific experiments. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment. And so they have lost confidence in the report and the validity uh, of its conclusions. We note that the majority of the authors have agreed in principle to retract the report, but they have been unable to agree on the wording of their statement. Therefore, we're going to retract it ourselves. It's always best if the authors retract it on their own. Right, but in this case, they have not to this date. And Dave Tuller again covered this in the New York Times, you can see here. So it's being read by a lot of people. Uh, you may remember there was a second a study that was positive out of the NIH and FDA, the low alter study where they detected uh, uh, retroviruses in these CFS samples, but they were different retroviruses. So they retracted their paper, which was from PNAS. Um, and they say basically we can't repeat any of this and we can't even tell if there's mouse contamination there so we're going to retract it uh, and there's currently there is a study being done coordinated by Ian Lipkin up at Columbia of 150 well characterized samples which have been distributed to a number of labs and presumably these will all be negative and that will be the final official end um, to this story but it's not quite over yet um, we don't know what causes CFS still. And what about XMRV and prostate cancer? 
these, none of these papers have been retracted that were positive for XMRV in, in prostate cancer, but it's impossible that XMRV could cause prostate cancer because this is a laboratory generated virus. So it's very unlikely that it does. Um, it might be a related virus, but there's no evidence for that forthcoming yet. So we'll see what happens with that. Maybe next year we'll have some more retractions. Now in the meantime, a very sordid turn in this event, in this affair took place. And one of the investigators on the original science paper, uh, she was fired. And she was fired because she gave a talk in Ottawa and she showed this slide saying that 5-azacytidine stimulates uh, XMRV, HGRV, human gamma retroviruses from PBMCs of CFS patients. So she's saying now it's not just XMRV, it's some other related gamma retroviruses. And if you treat their cells with 5 aza c you can get these to replicate. And she showed this Western blot as proof that you can rescue gamma retroviruses from these cells. So someone got a copy of her slide presentation and looked at it and said, you know, this looks awfully similar to figure two from the science paper, which is labeled completely differently. So first of all, there's 5 A's of C here. When you, when you treat cells with 5 A's of C, you can induce retroviral replication. There is no 5 A's of C in this figure. The patient numbers are different as well. And so someone dug up the original x-ray of this western blot and indeed there's 5 A's of C on it. This matches the science figure perfectly. The uh, 5 A's of C is shown on here. The patient numbers match this one. So it's the same western blot which was published in science yet it wasn't labeled that they had treated these with 5 A's of C and um, the patient numbers were different. So this is why she was fired from, partly why she was fired from her job uh, at uh, the institute that had done this work. And that's why Bruce Albert said there's a lot of other uh, funny business going on. Now this could be an error or it could be something worse than that. But it completely destroys all confidence, of course, that um, these results had any validity at all. Now, um, she ended up going to jail because when she was fired, she stole her laptop with all her laboratory results on it and wouldn't give it back to the institute when they requested it. Uh, and um, so she was arrested and made to give back um, the, the laptop. And this is a very nice article by Trina Suderos, who uh, I've also gotten to know over the course of this um, uh, incident. She's a writer, a science writer at the Chicago Tribune. This is great. Two years ago, a researcher was hi riding high atop a wave of promise. In a stunning twist, she was arrested on Friday and spent five years in a California jail. So I just got an email today from Dave Tuller, and he said, Did you hear that uh, in the trial, in her trial, the judge is recusing himself because he invested in the company that? in the institute that did this work to begin with. So this is what a mess this is. Um, so anyway, um, as far as I know, the institute doesn't do any of this kind of work uh, anymore. So the moral of this story is not to trust any particular scientist, that everything that's done has to be validated by more than one person. Trust science, not scientists. And many people don't get this. They see when something is published, that's it. Give me the drug to take care of this now. But it has to be validated. In this case, you can see many people worked on it to try and validate it, and they couldn't. So in the end, we got the answer. Science figured out uh, what was wrong. So if you remember one thing from this course, remember that. <laughs>